Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, presentation for uh, Bantsteel and Revit collaboration tips and tricks. My name is John Bennett, and I work as a customer success manager for Greytech, working with structural products. A uh, couple of housekeeping things. Everybody's obviously muted during the call today, uh, this webinar. There is a handout in the handout box on your window. You should be able to see that as a PDF file of the presentation today. Uh, so you, you can have a copy of that if you so wish. Um, we will try and get to some questions if we have time. If not, please type them in the chat window and we'll follow them up afterwards. Just quickly, a little bit about my background. I've been working with uh, steelwork for a very long time now. Um, started off doing steelwork detailing, progressed to be a CAD manager. Um, sort of worked with Advanced Steel for about 20 years now. Uh, obviously, we've seen the evolution into using Revit as well. Um, I sort of transferred across into the channel, worked as an application engineer for Grey Tech, then went to Autodesk for a few years to work with them to help promote Advanced Steel on a global level. Came back to Grey Tech to work as a CSM for them. And obviously that's led me to working with various engineering, fabrication and structural companies over the last few years. So a little bit of uh, background behind uh, Grey Tech. Obviously, some of you may be familiar with us. We started off as a European company and obviously we've spread to be a global presence now. Our staff numbers keep going up uh, every month from what I can see as we make more acquisitions in our IP, etc., and obviously resell our network. So we've been around for quite a few years now, uh, obviously 30 years, started off in France. So I've seen rapid growth over the last four or five years. And uh, obviously we continue to grow. Um, we have a lot of technical staff, I think about 350 now working with those. We have some R&D staff developing our own product as well. And obviously we have a good relationship with our customers. So the foundation of our product range is basically using the Autodesk products enhanced with our Greytech products to help you create elements. We also have our own simulation products like Advanced Design, which help you design your buildings and sort of create the structural design required behind that to transfer into the create elements. We try and combine those together with our fabrication elements, uh, Advanced Workshop being one of those and Armor Plus. And recently we've moved into the common data environment with our own managed software, which is OpenTree and where we're combining all this together to help you manage your documents and data coming in and going out of your company and linking into common data environments like BIM 360. So today we're going to talk about the advanced steel extension for Revit and how that interacts between the two platforms. I'm trying to give you a little bit of background and history behind how it works etc how it came about and how to utilize it so the first thing is obviously in the 2020 version where do you find it so it should be available for you to download via your autodesk account this is the only place you'll find it now it's not out on the app store in 2020 in previous versions uh, 2018 it was out on the autodesk app store for revit but now it's via your account, so you need to access your account, either log in online or to use the desktop app that you see available from Autodesk. So obviously we're just gonna run through a quick video here. It's done by my uh, ex-colleague of mine, friend of mine in uh, works for Autodesk. So this is actually uh, downloading this from the Autodesk app that comes and installs on your desktop machine. So he'll just run through that. And obviously once he's done that, he's installed it, you'll find it appear in the add-ins ribbon tab inside Revit. It's a little settings dialog. You can change some parameters in here if you so wish. Uh, it also populates to the libraries that are available and installed and delivered with Revit. So obviously it creates an, a file, which is the uh, steel markup language file, which is the transfer file between the two platforms. 
Switching to Advanced Steel, you'd come to the Import Export ribbon. Obviously, select the same file using the Import button, and you'll pull the file across into Advanced Steel. And in essence, that's the way it's worked for a number of years now. And there's obviously been different changes and routes to that. Some of the enhancements we've seen in the last few years has been adding plates, bolts, and connection elements. Um, you can actually model these inside Revit now as well. You can do the connections, but you can also do the basic elements as well. Also, modifications and synchronization between platforms can be transferred here. We see the beams being moved, and then we're going to re-export the file with a different name. And we're actually going to take that back into the Revit platform and do a synchronization between the two products. So again, the same dialog, but the sync button. Load the file. And you'll see that the beam will move when you apply the actions. And there's a little cyan change there. That's the background processing working in the system. So in essence, that is how it works between the two platforms. It seems very simple. And in essence, it is very simple. But there can be a few you know, sort of tips and tricks along the way and a few pitfalls as well. So how does all this work? What's actually going on in the background? What's the basis of it? And the next few slides, we're going to try and cover that sort of area and give you a little bit of insight into how it started, the certain changes over the last few years and where we are now with it. So the original mechanism was based upon a very simple thing called an expression rule, which basically tracked the object shape, name, reference, etc. Used a couple of tables inside what's called the GTC uh, database. Uh, the, so that is the database where all these tables are stored. There's two there, profile conversion and profile export conversions. And basically it was a formula that was written to basically condense an entire group of sections together into one line. And that was used to transfer between the two platforms, being that there was commonality between naming, etc. Um, just a bit to mention also throughout the presentation, you will see there's some sort of hyperlinks embedded inside this document. You can click on those if you've got the PDF and they should take you to the various help link pages. I've we'll tried to put a few of those into today's presentation because there's just so much information available. It's very difficult to encompass all that in a few slides. So sort of leading on from that a little bit more about the expression. So obviously both softwares are based on shape rules. So you have a shape code inside uh, Advanced Steel and inside Revit as well. And there's obviously commonality in the naming and approach. And basically this is what the basis of the expression rule was. It was to map the section reference from one system to the other and try and condense that into one line. Now, this can be quite difficult to sort of do for the average user. So there were other sort of mechanisms created over the years to allow sort of a one to one mapping. Uh, we we'll come on to talk about the section name, key name and the dynamic as well. And the process has sort of changed over the last three or four years. They've tried different things to sort of see if they can get it better, etc. But in essence, the expression rule is still the basic one that's there. It's always been there and it's still there now inside the system. So this is the most common one that most users will see as the one-to-one -one references. This is what's used uh, to map when you actually try and map a profile and you're not, you don't see it for the first time. Uh, users will come across this quite often and its origins was in the fact that although we were using expression rules that encompass most of the sections, there was always a few typos or something where someone would type something in. The simple thing like an uppercase and lowercase x would actually throw out the expression rule and, and miss a section out. So the ability to add a one to one reference got round this so you could have an uppercase and lowercase typo and it would actually make it still work. And also when most users now map sections, they will see the dialogue appear and you'll get the one to one mapping reference appear. And that will then be added in to the various profile conversion table, the profile export conversion table, which are both available inside the GTC mapping databases. The other thing to watch out for is there are two database locations, one inside Advanced Steel now, which is an MDF, and one inside the Advanced Folder, which is an MDB. The MDB is used by Revit, the MDF is used by Advanced Steel. So it can be a little bit confusing, but just watch out for that when you're actually trying to create mappings, or if you need to take any mappings out, those are the database tables you need to go and look for.
So the family based section mapping sort of was in 2018, 2019 versions and it used the name. This is the internal name that you see inside advanced steel. It was transferred into the Revit file naming under the family. It was quite a good method. Uh, this method was designed and controlled by Autodesk to use their approved families. So this is the way it worked. Uh, basically, obviously, we have a name for about inside advanced steel. That's what it's called. They would use the corresponding name inside Revit. They would link it via a table that was available inside advanced steel called the Revit AS profile conversion table again. So you would find this and it would work and it worked very well providing you had approved families. It wouldn't work with non approved families. And there was no way as far as we could find for the uh, average user or end user to actually utilize this technology. Um, so they've actually ceased doing this. I think as of like the 2020 version, they don't do this anymore. Uh, in the 2018, 19 version it's present and it did help get around a lot of issues. So in this slide, we're just going to take a look at the run through the basic transfer as we saw it in the 2019 version of the software. So this is a model inside Revit. Obviously, it's very simple. The idea was not to make a complicated model, but just try and make something simple, show you the basic family structures that are available. Obviously, you can see connections in there. Just clicking on the U-Beam library. So what I've done is I've actually loaded in all my sections. Now, there's some debate as to whether you should do that or not do that. Personally, I'm used to working with Advanced Steel and having all my section library available, or at least the preference version of it that I want to use. The other thing is materials to watch out for. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but fundamentally in this example, I've created some materials with some dedicated colors using the uh, materials browser inside Revit. And the, the reason for that is I obviously want to map them to some particular advanced steel materials as well. So I found by creating my own materials inside Revit, I could make my transfer a lot easier between the two softwares. So we'll come on and talk a little bit more about materials later on. But fundamentally in this, we're going to sort of export this now via the plugin. I'm just going to check the settings. So we just always check the settings dialog to see what's going on. So I'm just showing that. So it's in the 19 libraries here. Obviously, I've got export grids uh, set in there. This dialog has changed over the last few years as well. Some bits have appeared and disappeared inside it, I've noticed. So here we're just exporting. We're going to create an SMLX file. So I'd get a very simple basic name. You can type in whatever you want for a name here. So obviously try and keep it something that's referenced to your project. I would tend to put the files in a folder so I knew where they were so I can go and find them again. Swapping to Advanced Steel, obviously we can open a template, have a new file set up. I'm just going to put it in the conceptual view mode so you can see it. Go to the Export Import Ribbon tab, press the Import button. Go and pick the same file that we just created. So we pick on that, open, and we pull the model in quite quickly. So this is just no connections. This is how it was in 19. Uh, it's brought it in, it's brought the materials across. Obviously, as you can see the beams have come in and they've come in with the uh, cutbacks that you see from, from Revit as well. And this is the way it worked in 19. I think in 20, we've got the disable cutbacks available again, so they don't actually come across. We don't normally like to see those in advanced steel because it gets in the way of us obviously putting a connection on, you end up with a double shortening on the end of a beam. So here we can see that the sections have been transferred in and they're using the core library of advanced steel. So this is important to note actually, because when it's done with a dynamic profile, which we'll talk about later on, it doesn't actually do that. So that was quite important, I found. So just to pop back to Revit to sort of, sort of refresh and show you that I was using the same beams and columns. And obviously you can see the beam listed there. So the column in this case, and obviously I'm accessing the library. So the important thing to remember inside Revit is you have columns and you have what's called structural framing. There is a difference between the two and the way they're seen inside Revit. And also when you import and export them, it actually makes a difference. And this method was actually also where it had the structural name key present inside the family itself as well, which was linking to advanced steel, as I mentioned earlier on. So the other 
sort of mechanism that was available up until the 2019 version was the dynamic profile mapping. Now, personally, I thought this was quite a good idea. It enabled a user to map what was considered to be a standard shape code section, but the section might not be known inside the advanced steel database. So for example, a cold form section might have been created by a third party supplier present inside Revit, exported by the technician, and then obviously being brought in to advanced steel. But in advanced steel, the cold rolled supplier might not exist, or it might not be recognized inside the system. Therefore, the dynamic option used the profile code in the background, and it would transfer it in and bring it into the advanced steel model. It would bring it in just to that model, so it would not add it back in to the core database. It was only found in the model that you actually sent it in. So with that, it sort of it worked quite well. There were a few issues with it, um, and Autodesk decided not to continue with that past the end of the 2019 version. <clears throat> but up until 2019, you can use this. It also got around some of the issues over family creation, profile rotation as well. And there were ways that you could sort of, even if you brought it in and you recognized what the section was, so the detailer probably doesn't know what's coming to him. If it came in, you could look at it and you think, oh, I recognize that, and you could change it to the one that you wanted, you recognized, or you already had inside your system. So to me, as I've said, I thought it was quite useful in certain aspects. Other aspects, I thought it got in the way of what we were trying to do. Again, there's a hyperlink at the bottom of the page. So in the next series of slides, we're gonna just sort of touch on the materials, talk around the families, the approved families, how to create families, a few basic rules that you should use when you're working with Advanced Steel and Revit. So earlier on, I mentioned materials. Basically, they are created within the AEC materials of Revit. That's where they start from. Obviously, we have materials inside Advanced Steel as well, and they're linked via a materials table mapping inside the GTC database. Um, obviously, if you look at the material inside Advanced Steel, they have a particular name. Uh, obviously, you can map them to a different name inside Revit, but during my experimentation, I found that it's probably better to actually create corresponding materials. So if you're trying to go from advanced steel to Revit, if you make sure that the material exists inside the model before you import it, it won't create it on the fly. If you don't, it will create a material on the fly, probably give it a slightly different name than what you expect. And then when you try and map it back the other way, it comes back in and it has to create another mapping. So even if you're coming from Revit to advanced steel, in my opinion, it's probably better that someone gives you just a little schedule of what the sections are that you're getting and also the materials that they've used within the model. And that's actually their names, because I found that the name being used to actually name the material inside Advanced Steel, it uses the key name. And the key name can be actually different to the name that's actually displayed when you see it inside uh, Advanced Steel. So I found this out the hard way and the next slide will have a little video in it where I talk through or show you the issue that I found with a particular material range that's quite common for us in the UK, which is cold rolled. And I'll explain that further in the next slide. So just remember the key name inside Advanced Steel is actually the name that's actually used inside Revit. And my opinion is that you should actually just try and get a schedule of materials from someone. It's quite easy to do. People can schedule now in Revit using the uh, steel stuff there's there's bit of materials that can be produced schedules can come from revit and they can be exported to excel or csv files etc etc so it can be done to get that information quite quickly now with the various uh, attributes and tags available inside revit so here we're just going to take a look at this video here and it's the same model. And what I've actually done is I've gone off and I found a third party family that was on the web. I downloaded it and I installed it into my model. So this is quite similar. This is what people would do. Uh, not all the families come available inside from manufacturers inside the Revit standard. You'd go to somewhere like BIM store or somewhere like that and you would download and install this and add it to the model. Now, in this case, they're, they are a, what's called a cold rolled section. So cold rolled is quite common in my country. It's called light gauge steel elsewhere. And, and we do have a particular material type inside advanced steel. 
So if we just flip to an advanced steel model for a minute, you can see there's obviously some cold rolled in this model and it has a very particular material. And it's if you just look at the way that it's spelt, it's cold with a space and then rolled. Now that doesn't look too complicated. You think that would map backwards and forwards quite easy. And that's what I thought initially when I tried to do it. And actually I got caught out because the name that I actually needed to call the material inside Revit was cold rolled but no space between the two because there was a difference in the naming and I'll sort of show you that as we go through this video here so this is the uh, profile uh, sorry, materials conversion table inside the GTC database so I'm actually using the SQL editor here so you can use management tools and the table editor if you want um, I tend to use the SQL uh, editor now it sort of gives me a few more options for uh, importing and exporting data and creating data you can see some materials that I've created there some mappings that I've created from materials than when I was sort of testing this process so I was obviously looking in this table to try and see what was going on with my issue. And it, it did take me a while because there's quite a lot of entries, as you can see, as I'm scrolling through here, uh, where obviously from previous mappings, not only to uh, Revit and Advanced Steel, but also from us to Plot 3D and even to other softwares, the uh, application is actually another table reference at the end there. So a lot of these names will be quite familiar uh, to people inside who've seen the advanced steel materials available. So looking at a materials table, obviously we tend to keep the material name quite simple for steel. It's normally a grade. But here, if you look at cold roll, which is line 451 in the middle of the screen, you'll see that it doesn't actually have a space in it. And I didn't realize that, first of all, but there is actually a difference in the naming of the material. So what I found in my experimentation was that when I went to look at the material that I was creating inside Revit, to actually get it to work and map without causing me a mapping issue, I actually had to create the material with the same name, cold, no space rolled. Obviously, I've set the color to be blue just to be different, to be honest. I mean, you can do that if you want. I mean, not a lot of people do that in Revit. Me personally, I'm used to working with layers and colors and things. So it was just the way I worked and decided I would change it. So we notice here cold space rolled. So it's different in its presentation inside the dialog inside advanced steel. So obviously when I went to create the material, I thought, oh, I just created cold space rolled. And then when I tried to map it in, it didn't work. So when I went back and looked at it and did a little bit of digging around, I thought, hang on, I wonder if it's the internal name. And I went and looked and yes, the internal or the run name of advanced steel is cold space rolled, but the key name is cold rolled. So this is a very simple little thing, a little sort of trip up that can happen if you don't actually know about it. And I found it caused quite a bit of hassle because when I was going backwards and forwards, I seemed to get stuck in this mapping loop between the two softwares. It just kept remapping it. But once I figured it out, it went backwards and forwards without any hassle at all. So here I've obviously got my, my Albion section, I think it is. Yeah, it was an Albion supplier that I picked just as a third party product, downloaded, installed it. I'm going to go and set the material, make sure it's set to cold rolled. So obviously you can access the materials from the dialog. Just click on it, change that, obviously go OK. And now the materials are set to cold rolled. You can see their color stayed blue. And we go back to the add-in and do the export. So again, we just check the settings to see what it is. I'm actually exporting as dynamic. And this is one of the things actually because I found that the actual Albion section was not created correctly by the the third party supplier. So when I actually bought it in, it rotated if I didn't have dynamic set. This is in the 2019 version. So here we go back and we obviously we create a name for this. We name the file um, so that we can find it again. So obviously I was doing quite a bit of testing at the time. So I'm trying to designate this so I can see what it is. So obviously it's just material test cold rolled. So obviously with the export dynamic, it actually keeps the rotation. So that was one of the big plus points I found in the 2019 version again back inside advanced steel just going to pull up a template obviously go to the import button again when we get there and go and select the file that we just created with the cold rolled material example inside it so it brings the beams in they're rotated and positioned correctly obviously you can see the the beams listed there and they come across with their material but more importantly if we go and look at the cold rolled sections or the ones that have got the cold rolled material, we can see the section has been bought in. It is a dynamic section, now it's the difference with dynamic, it just pulls it in and shows you that 
So even though I know that's an Albion beam, you can use match properties to change that if you want. But here we've gone straight to cold rolled, which was the important thing I was trying to do. I was trying to make sure that we transferred across and the model came across as a cold rolled section. So that was a little bit about the materials and the mapping. So that's something that you should sort of look out for. The other aspect of that is obviously working with the family. So obviously that was the imported family, but the software comes with families installed now. Back in 2018, you had to go and find the approved families from Autodesk. And these are basically ones that have standard shape code references, etc., inside them. Uh, but then they sort of moved on with sort of the next versions, 19 and 20. It actually comes all pre-installed. And the reason for that is because we saw this change into the steel fabrication workflow with the steel fabrication elements, with the introduction of bolts, plates, welds, etc. And obviously the list of these and what was available changed over the, the next couple of years. Also, we found when looking at behind, looking behind the families, we found that a couple of things definitely had to be set, even if you were creating the family yourself to make it work with the structural connections. The two important ones that we found there was uh, material must be set to steel. So that's the model behavior parameter must be set to steel and the section shape, you must use a supported section shape to get it to transfer across correctly. And um, also the geometric properties came into play as well. So again, there's a couple of help links on this, this page. So if you've got the PDF, you should be able to click on those and it will go to those particular pages. I, I think I've updated them all, they should all still be available. So it's fine using the standard families, but what happens if you wanted to do something that wasn't standard? So this is obviously going to occur all the time with people. So they're going to want to sort of look at these and make sure that they've got these things coming in. So one of the things was, you know, obviously if you've got a C profile, it's defined as a shape code. Okay, so it's a standard shape code that's available inside Advanced Steel and also inside Revit. The important thing that we found was to actually model it or create a family at the same correct orientation as a C-shape. And the issue that I'd had with the Albion sections when I brought them in is it was actually created like a U-shape. So the, the people that had created the family, which is probably right at the time when they did it, because they probably didn't know any different, it's only sort of this is sort of emerged in the last couple of years, is that if you create it, the profile correctly orientated, when you transfer it across, you don't get any issue with the rotation, an unexpected rotation of it. What happens is if it is rotated inside it will inside Revit, it will rotate it correctly. So the important other thing we found is create your profile for your family correctly and at the correct orientation. Similarly, you can create user profiles inside both softwares and you can transfer them now backwards and forwards. There is an option for that. We've noticed that coming in the 2020 version. I'll probably show that a bit later on in one of the videos that I've got. But again, Creating your user sections, there's a few links here. There's obviously links to creating the families here for the structural family content inside Revit as well. So just to sort of ram home some of that really, to be honest to people, is obviously using the C-Lipt as an example. Make sure that when you're sketching it out, when you're creating the family inside Revit, it matches the shape code definition, which again, you can get, you can find those on the Revit help pages under the family creation we found that we needed to create it and define it. And the other thing that was available as well is make sure that the material is set correct, the material behavior is set to steel. So you've got to make sure the shape code's right, material set category is set to steel as well for the, for the behavior. And the other thing that we then led into, which we didn't realize at the time, is if you're using dimensions, which a lot of people do to define the family, those dimensions need to be defined as geometrical properties. So the structural geometry needed to be defined within the family for it to work correctly. So there was these sort of three or four things that we found when we were going through this. Now, if you create these dimensions, we found that we could obviously sort of link those across between the two. So it would work, or you could just define it with correct structural section geometry to start off with. If you look at a standard family that you see delivered with the software from Autodesk, you will see how the structure is for the beam and the definition you can use that to give you a guide on how you should start going about creating your own custom families. So 
in the next series of slides, we're going to take a look at the steel tools. So for users of advanced steel, they'll probably be familiar with some of these. This was a new concept, a new way, a new approach for people working with Revit. So we've seen the steel connections come in over the last three, four years now. Uh, they were delivered and you had to install them originally. Now they're actually coming pre-installed. So you don't have to worry about that. So they are used fundamentally. They transfer via the SMLX file backwards and forwards. Uh, so you, will, you can obviously see them. You can load individual ones or you can load them all. Again, there's some debate as to whether you should load them all or load some of them. My personal opinion is if you're creating a template, you probably want to load the, the ones that you're going to use all the time. I'm from Advanced Steel. All my connections are available that I need. I can preference some of the ones that I want to see, but fundamentally I want to have the most available so I don't have to keep going in and loading them and reloading them. So my opinion at the time when we started using this was try and load as many as possible and create them inside a template. And this was the sort of forerunner before we then sort of we saw the next step of this was the introduction of the steel tab and some of the other primary elements that we were quite familiar with within the advanced steel platform. So then they brought in the steel tools, they brought in the new ribbon and they added the steel ribbon in. And we saw tools appear on here for creating plates, bolts and welds, also for doing what we call features. And these were like corner cut, cope, shorten, etc. These were all basic primary tools that we saw within Advanced Steel being migrated across into the Revit platform. Now, this also led to a change in the format of how the beam is actually seen inside Revit. This is quite a change for the users. Not many people have picked up on this, but fundamentally, if you apply one of these modifiers that they might call it uh, to the end of a beam, it will actually change how the beam is seen inside Revit. It turns it into what's termed a fabrication beam. Uh, it has all the fillets in it, etc. You can see the detail on the end and it changes its behavior. Once you've done that, it won't actually be able to go back as well. Um, this slide, I actually uh, cribbed some of this from a friend of mine in, in Australia. He wrote a very good article on it. So I've actually put um, a link down at the bottom of the page there. So you should be able to go and have a look at what's going on. So we're going to just we sort of touched on the the fabrication format there. So we're going to look at the, how that was impl implemented, and even this is so we saw this coming in in 2019. So I've gone back to my 2019 version, same in 2020 as well. So originally we saw the beams coming in and they were just sort of appearing in the model. We had a couple of cutbacks on the end of it, but as soon as we start applying a connection, so here we're just going to go in and so we pick and look at something here. We can shorten a beam if we want. And we can apply a standard connection detail. So connection detail, like it does in advanced steel, applies a combination of elements. So it's a base plate, a bolt, an anchor, a weld, stuff like that. So you can do that kind of stuff all combined together, or you can manually create it and create custom connections as well, also inside Revit. But here we're just going to sort of finish the selection. We're going to apply the connection to the base plate, to the bottom of the column, sorry. So that has actually changed the beam inside Revit and it's not noticeable for anybody to notice that change. And this this probably caused a few problems for people because they didn't realize it was going on. So once we figured out what was happening, we could explain it to people and then obviously put the connections on and then we could export the model with these details in. So similarly, you could affect obviously the end of the beam as well. You could put a connection on the beam would change how the beam was seen. So originally, um, obviously when we did this, originally we exported it as a basic model, it just came in and it didn't change anything. And as soon as we put this connection on between this column and this beam, it actually changes it to a fabrication beam. And as I said, the problem is you can't actually see that it's actually done that. Or you can see that the connection is applied. So the thing was also people asked about where did the connections come from? Well, the connections came from advanced steel. So we were quite familiar in seeing these dialogues when they came in because they're virtually identical to what we would see inside advanced steel. So anybody who's worked with advanced steel will be very, very familiar with these and will be able to adjust these standard connections. So obviously you can just go in, you can tweak the bolt spacings, horizontal, vertical setups. I think we've done some other webinars on this as well where we've done a little bit more detail 
behind how the connections work so and I think we have a download page for that so that you can access it now so here we're just adjusting this so this is the kind of stuff that we would do if you were in advanced steel you might have a library connection for that as well but um, in Revit we, do, we don't have a library as such there's a different approach to that which we'll see later on in the presentation today so I'm just adjusting all those and putting them in place and then I'm going to export this file across to the advanced steel platform So obviously we can still see the beam, it still says it's the same thing, etc. You, you can't see any change. Just check my settings. Now I've left it to set it as dynamic as well, because I just want to export the model and see what happens. So if we go export, go and create the file, obviously name it again. You don't always have to use it with the same file name. You can create several different exports from the same model. Obviously, you just need to watch what you're exporting as well. So, so coming back into Advanced Steel, we're going to go and create a new file inside Advanced Steel here. So we're going to pick that file that we've just created. And we're going to import the model. Now this crops up quite a bit actually. Uh, for some reason they decided to, it comes in this metal deck for plates. Um, I'm not sure why they did that. Um, I think it's just a glitch. I'm, I'm hoping it might get fixed one day. Uh, in this version obviously I had to map it. Once I'd mapped it to something, I mapped it to a material. It was fine. I managed to get it to transfer. I think there's an article out on the web about that as well. So if you look, you look hard enough, you'll find it. So when it comes in, it's obviously coming in and it's bringing the connection across. So this was good because we didn't lose the intelligence that we had. But what we did notice is that this beam is like a standard beam, even though we exported it's dynamic. So this is a good example when this actually triggered us to show that there was a change. But if you pick a column or a beam that's actually got a connection on it, we found it actually in 19 it changed it to be a dynamic profile which initially caused us a bit of issue and I thought hmm okay that's not a good move but at least we knew something had changed and when we went back and looked at it we figured that this change was down to the steel fabrication format that was being adopted inside Revit to transfer the models across again you can change this if you need to you can use match properties just to change it back to being a normal steel beam family or steel column family inside advanced steel so the same thing is obviously applying to the beam here as well because i put the the, the uh, end plate connection on there so this is quite obvious inside uh, the 2019 version and there was a change made and when we investigated it was to do with the steel fabrication format So what was that? It's the element transfer. So basically what it was, this was this change made that was brought in because we bought modifiers as they call them. So this is where we're changing plates, beams, stuff like that, cutting into the end of the beam, putting a cope in it, holes even through the beam. As soon as you apply these structural steel fabrication elements, it changed the way that the beam was seen inside Revit. Um, obviously, there was quite a bit written about it they had to work with supported shapes which goes back to what we said about the family creations etc looking at the standard families understanding that understanding why it was working why their materials were set etc so this method was completely different to what we'd seen from the previous versions obviously in 19 there was this new approach and this has continued into 20 as well the steel fabrication is still there as far as we can tell and it's still affected by the elements that you create it changes how the beam is seen inside Revit so it does cause a little bit of con uh, confusion but once you explain it to people sort of on a one-to-one -one basis or in a training course etc they sort of get to understand it again there's some help links in the page here if you want to go and have a look and look at those I mean if you just sort of click on those it should go off 
and uh, open a web page. So that's the 2019. The 20 versions is exactly the same, and it explains what is what is transferred, not transferred, what is happening to the various things. And they term these as modifiers, I think, inside uh, uh, Revit, rather than we would call them features inside of Ant Steel. So in a series of slides here, we're just going to offer a few tips that we sort of picked up along the way, um, really to do with obviously creating elements and creating a template. So Revit's all about a template, the same as Advanced Steel. Working at the origin, we found that was quite a good point. Also defining the origin and finding it, reveal hidden elements, and then just draw some lines or circles around it so you know where it is. Working with levels, we found that was really good. Try not to use large offsets inside Revit. A lot of people put a beam on a level and then drop it down sort of 500 mil and they actually move it and leave the system line or what we would call the system line up at the level. It causes all kinds of problems. Try and not do that. Grids, try and just transfer them once. I probably don't bother after that because grids are seen different between the two softwares. Um, they do work with the transfer, but once you've done it once, you probably don't. You can uncheck it so you don't transfer the grid backwards and forwards. Try and work with the approved families, and if you're trying to create your own families, make sure you create them correctly. My, again, my personal view was to create a template and load as many steel sections as I was going to use on a common day-to-day -day basis. But again, that's personal preference. Depends whether you want to keep going in and loading the families each time you try and transfer something backwards and forwards, or you're trying to model something. I haven't got this steel size, I haven't got that. You're trying to create a dedicated template for modeling the steel. We would put the steel in a dedicated model as well. A few more ideas on these, uh, this slide. Uh, so again, for sort of both focused on Revit, so steel connections, my personal view is as load as many as possible. You can load them all, you can sort of load a few. Steel materials, make sure that you've got them mapped correctly and create them inside your Revit template. So if you're working a lot of the time between steel fabrication and engineering, so if you're internal in a company, just liaise between departments so that you're actually using the same materials. It just cuts down on all the mapping backwards and forwards, makes it a lot easier to manage it by the people trying to manage the systems in the background. Colors, you just need to get to grip with how they work inside Revit to how they work inside Advanced Steel. Also, the control of the visual graphics and the various overrides associated inside Revit is different to how we control what we see inside Advanced Steel. Okay. Um, I personally make the steel connections stand out, make them a different colour than the base colour so I can see them and identify them, etc. They just stand out to me. That's just because that's the way I want to work. Also, materials, you can change the base colour as well so you can see a difference in materials by selecting that material. It changes colour so you know you've got different materials inside the model. Again, that's just my personal preference. Uh, also, there's a tip at the bottom of the page here, a help link on making your template you create the default one. So, so moving across to advanced steel, we found there's a management tool setting that needs to be set to make sure that you transfer backwards and forwards without the need to number the model. So we've highlighted that one. I think it's set in other countries, but in ours, for some reason, it was set the other way. Levels, again, advanced steel, if you put a beam on a level, it will transfer across into Revit. It will also take the level across. The other thing I found was if you're doing that, just take it into a template inside Revit that only has one level in it. If you've got a level that's slightly different than the one you're transferring it from, what I found is sometimes it attaches it to beam to that level and offsets it down. Again, the origin, that's an important one as well. The model transfer works about the origin between the two platforms. That's the 000 point of the world coordinate system. So try and work around that. There's other ways to do project offset coordinates inside Revit. There's a way to offset coordinates inside uh, Advanced Steel, Stroke AutoCAD as well, if you need to sort of collaborate a project together. But just work around the origin. It's just so much easier when you're transferring the two models backwards and forwards. 2020, we had some new features come in in Revit and also in Advanced Steel, some of this sort of filled across between the two platforms. Obviously, there's a link there, as we've seen, so we'll get into this. So the main thing was uh, an update in Dynamo, which is quite interesting as well, and also the introduction of Steel Connections for Dynamo. 
and that was linked to some important uh, performance enhancements we saw going on in the background for the detailing sheets uh, obviously additional parameters which also led into additional tags so a tag is a label inside a band steel we call it a label inside the Revit they call it a tag and the ability to dimension elements was changed also inside Revit to allow further detailing inside the Revit platform for downstreaming, obviously, transfer of information down into the advanced steel detailing program. Obviously, the steel connection propagation and grouping came as a sort of byproduct of what was required to do the dynamo from what we could work out. And also, we saw some of that come into the advanced steel platform as well. The biggest one that changed that nobody actually sort of actually wrote it in black and white anywhere, which we figured out is basically for 2020, all the other formats that we saw, the uh, apart from the rules based transfer expression rules and the one to one mapping, all the other stuff to do with dynamic file name stuff, all that file name key stuff, all that went away. It just disappeared. It went away. So in here, we just have a basic transfer now and we're going to look at this model that we created inside Revit here, and we're actually gonna transfer this out to advanced steel. So this is very similar to where we started, right back at the beginning of the presentation, but now we're in the 2020 version. Um, again, you know, it's the same process. The process has not changed. It's just they've taken away some of the other variables that are in the system. It basically is just a one-to-one -one mapping. You still need to make sure your families are created correctly. You're using the right families. You don't have, shape code defined i've found issues with that it doesn't transfer out properly you get all kinds of weird stuff coming up so you have to use the families the family even if you create your own families they have to be created correctly you can create your own mappings as well if you're bringing stuff in that hasn't been mapped before it comes up with a one-to-one -one mapping dialog so again we're going to go to the import export ribbon tab press the import button select the file Uh, this is uh, comes from a model that we uh, we use uh, internally for doing some and also for some training. So it covers a vast number of different elements. So I bought the model in, obviously from uh, from the Revit platform. So this is typically the downstream workflow, and then you would obviously set about probably you'd probably have to order a few things. So we found that grids tends to bring grids in at several different levels because we only have grid at one level in advanced steel which is why i said just bring it in once okay here you'll find a section will come in obviously I've, I've again created my materials inside revit to get them to transfer across for the cold rolled so this this is the basic transfer with no connections i'm just selecting the beams obviously there it's picked up on the fact they're cold rolled so i can actually transfer those using the select cold rolled elements and I'm actually going to move those into the cold rolled layer. So it's quite quick and quite easy to start adjusting things as you would normally do. But at least you've got the principal model. And this is the basis of what's going on between the two softwares now. Typically, if you're downstreaming, obviously you're downstreaming into the detail program. You'd finish the detailing in here. You could put all the connections on. Someone could have sent you some examples of connections if they wanted. To be honest, in my opinion, it's probably still easier to do it inside advanced steel, although there are some improvements, which we'll see in the next series of slides as well, over the use of Dynamo and the Dynamo player. I just wanted to show also the one-to-one -one mapping transfer. So this is still current um, and this is being used as well. So here I've got some examples here. This is a project we worked on to create some studying framework for a particular user um, and it was actually a, a standard family we were liaising with the, with the manufacturer over this and you can see here we have framing and we have columns so these are the same section but obviously one is a column one is a framing element and if you transfer it as a column it, from a column family it will transfer into advanced steel as a column if you transfer it as a framing element it comes in as a beam can make a difference you can draw a beam in a vertical direction as well if you need to so here we've we've added these families in. So again, we've gone off, we found them on a site, probably BIM store or whatever it's called. And then we've actually installed these, added them into our template. And again, we're just gonna export them from the Revit platform into the Advanced Steel platform. And I wanted to test them one-to-one -one mapping with something that was completely non-standard. It was not something that was available. Now, 
I did know that these families were created correctly inside the um, Revit platform because uh, we were advised on that. So what I did is inside Advanced Steel, I created a corresponding reference. So I've, this is what I'm saying. The profile didn't exist, but I knew it was a Kingspan profile. I knew what the details were. So I created it as a profile inside Advanced Steel. So just drew that out just to show that. And then what I'm going to do is obviously I'm going to import that in and bring it in to the Advanced Steel platform. Now the mapping dialog will appear. Now you notice that also the user profile is option is available there as well, which we tested that as well, and that does work. So you can map it to a user profile, it will create a dedicated entry inside the profile uh, table. So the Aster profile table and make entries in profile master table. But here we're just going to do a one-to-one -one mapping and convert it to an existing profile because we knew it was coming in someone's told us that so this is again the ace between whoever it is don't just send them an xmx file tell them what you've got in the xml xmlx file do a schedule from the revit model transfer it across and here i've created the family so i'm, I'm going to map it to this existing profile and it's going to create some entries in the system now obviously inside advanced steel it's only one section reference i don't need to have two different ones one for beams and one for columns it's just one set of profiles so with me doing this, press the OK button, we'll come in once for that. And it's probably going to pop up again because it wants to do it for the other one, which is obviously the column, even though we know they're the same section size. So again, I'm going to go and do this. So I'm just going to go and check. I'm just showing you that obviously I've obviously mapped it or browsed to this part of the system to get to the section because I knew what it was when it was coming in. So one's coming as a column, one's coming as a beam. OK. Now what it's done is obviously created some entries in the background. So here we're going to take a look by the table editor. This is the other way to view entries that are added in the database. Do you need to use the second button and browse to the MDF for the GTC? So this is the one that's inside advanced deal. Profile conversion table, we'll go to the bottom of this. You'll probably find some entries, sort of about 20,000, 22,000. And you can see there what's going on. Okay. So if you look at the DTC standard there, you can see a slight difference in the naming. That's because one's a column family, the other one is a stud from the beam family. If we come back into the Revit, you can see there one's the column family and one's the stud family down here. So it actually uses those references inside Revit as the, the, so the family name inside there as part of the DTC mapping arrangement on a one-to-one -one mapping. Similarly, in the other table here, you can see it's created the same entries here using the GTC standard is the same. So that is the family name inside Revit. So the other thing that came up was the synchronization between the two softwares. So just want to quickly run through this. So here you can sync a model between the two. So this is basically uh, where you make some changes in the model. So here I've added in some sections, I've added in some connections, etc., between the two. OK, so these are three extra sections. They're not going to be in the other model. I've got some connections in for base plates, uh, connections to the purlins, uh, sorry, the rails to the column, the haunch connection. And I've added a connection in around the mezzanine floor there for the head of the column there and the three beams that are coming in. So obviously this is uh, sending it back to uh, Revit from Advanced Steel. So we do the same thing. So we create a file. We obviously created it before. We're just overwriting that file. We'll switch across to our Revit platform in a minute. And we can see the model inside Revit. And we're going to go to the same button, the add-ins button. But instead of doing the import, we're actually going to use the synchronization option. So this model doesn't have those elements in it. We're going to press the sync dialog button and it's going to appear on the screen and we're going to load the file. So obviously press the load button, browse to the same file that we just created. So this is the same SMLX file. Uh, it doesn't have to be the same name as the model. You can call it slightly different if you want. Even if you've sent it out once and your bloke wants to send it back, you can sync to any different file. Obviously, you know, just watch out. Certain elements are highlighted in different colors. So it says there I've deleted some grids, etc. Obviously, you modified ones of the beams, which I would expect because I added some connections in. And obviously, there's some new elements, which it's seeing the connection. So it's picking the connections up from the SMLX file. 
so you can filter this if you want to so like i don't want to see the grids because i don't really need to worry about the grids so and i don't want to delete the grids because i probably want to leave them inside my revit model so even though i didn't filter them out i can filter them out here you can filter any different combination of elements that are listed in this little checkbox dialog at the bottom here and then obviously you would apply the filter as we did just now and then obviously you would go up tick the uh, status option here which we saw being demonstrated by the first video that we did but here we're actually doing it sort of in a slightly different context so apply all actions so that will process that in the background this also shows some of the changes that we saw in the background behavior background processing inside revit uh, there's a little button down the bottom you can just sort of see it moving away i'll try and expand it here so you can see this is stuff that's being done in the background so this enables you to just carry on doing what you're doing see this quite a bit now being used when they're applying this kind of stuff and also connections inside the Revit model. <clears throat> this again was one of the performance enhancements that I mentioned. So it just takes a few minutes to do that. Obviously once it's done we can sort of have a look you can see the sections have appeared now. You can see the connections have been added on to the purlins, uh, sorry rails to the columns and also the head of the uh, mezzanine floor sort of section there uh, the haunch they were looking at the haunch there sorry on the rafter and then the mezzanine floor just here you can see those connections have been added in they weren't available when we first started but we've used the sync option to do that similarly you can create a report file from this as well which can be set to go off to word So I'm just going to access that and bring it across from my other screen. So that's fundamentally the synchronization process between the two softwares. And it, it is working from what I've seen in the 20 version. So some of the other things just to touch on was the propagation of connections. This was came in at the start of 20. Um, this is where you can select a bunch of beams. You put a connection in. You can then propagate it across those series, same sort of instances of those beams. And it works with visible steel members that you can see. So you obviously you have a view, a plan view inside Revit. It will apply it to the same conditions. This was a change in the way that you behaved before you had to copy the connection, but the propagate option gives you a way to sort of apply it to the same conditions throughout the model. Also, we saw a change in the way that connections were sort of grouped together as well. You could apply a different instance of a connection. So this led to like the creation of library of connections. So you can have the same connection, but with a different name inside it so you can reuse it and you can transfer it to different projects so this is like we have libraries of connections inside advanced steel of a particular connection type this is the same kind of theory so you could create them in a model and then they could be transferred across to a different project this also had a spin-off into the dynamo element and the dynamo player element using connections which we'll come on to <clears throat> Quite a big improvement in Dynamo. You can model with Dynamo. There's some scripts been put in. There's a very clever gentleman inside Autodesk that's written some stuff for this. They're supplied out of the box with the script and they run through the Dynamo player. Uh, there was a further update also at 20.2 where they sort of enabled you to link to some external models and reference models. So when I first looked at this, it was a bit, you had to have everything loaded in the template to get it to work. But now I think it's slightly different. So you can see that Autodesk are pushing to try and find different ways to automate and speed up the application of standard connections within the Revit environment before downstreaming the model even into the advanced steel environment. So here we see an example of a steel building. This is an Autodesk video, to be perfectly honest. And obviously we're going to load and apply a connection. So we're going to apply the base plate connection to the columns. So you press the play button and it applies all the connections to that particular column type. Similarly, they're going to go off and we're going to pick the apex connection. So these are the connections that are loaded and stored in the model. And you can actually have a different instance of those. So you can see there's different ones there. Base plate two, for example, was applied so here we're going to just apply an apex connection based upon the beam type okay but you can have a different type of the apex connection so this is how to apply a library of connections and we saw this coming in at the start of 20 and so we've sort of played around with it, it does seem to work quite well 
it's quite a good use of the Dynamo technology and it also links to the core connection technology changes that we've seen with the different instances being added in to the various templates for connections inside Advanced Steel and sorry inside Revit. So in 20.2, one of the things that we found was a bit of a problem in the original one was that you had to have everything stored in one template. But when they sort of released the 20.2 towards the end of last year, which I picked up when I went to AU, is you don't have to have the connections loaded. You can actually use a Dynamo script they've now introduced where you can actually load the connections from an external model. So this means you can have a series of library models present. So you can actually lie, load this and it will load connections from a different template location. And with that in place, you can then run those scripts to apply the connections to the model as we saw previously in the previous video. So now that's loaded all those scripts that come from the other model. So now if we go back in the connection tab, you can see they've been loaded in. And it will load all the instances that are stored in that. So that means you don't have to have them all stored in one template. You can create a series of templates to store your connections. So that was again another improvement that sort of crept in towards the end of last year. I think it's quite a good improvement for applying standard connections inside Revit. So if we draw towards the end of the presentation today, there's been a lot of information here. There's a lot more information out there. I've put stuff, I created a links page. So I've tried to put as much information as possible here over the various blogs, etc., video pages, help pages, our webinars that we've run, uh, links to a couple of classes there from AU. One of those was mine. You'll see some of the materials I've shown you today that are in that class. That class was 90 minutes, so I've cut quite a bit out from today. Also, the demand design automation one was the one that showed the dynamo stuff from uh, thomas as well so that was quite a good thing to go and look at and if you've got the pdf you should be able to access that and just to remind you really at the end obviously we're here to help we've tried to find out a lot of stuff here ourselves uh, over the last sort of 18 months two years we've really pushed into this area we're obviously offering a lot of standard advanced steel training workshop days and that, and we're doing some specialized training days for uh, Revit to advanced steel, advanced steel to Revit, sort of one, two day courses to try and explain what I've tried to explain in sort of 60 minutes to people. It takes a lot longer, there's a lot more in depth stuff going on behind that. So please reach, feel free to reach out to the sales team or myself if you would like some advice on how to get on one of these courses how to even if it's just a basic one-to-one -one workshop day or something we can do that as well we sort of run out of time so there's really no time for any questions but i'll pick up anything that's come in the chat window today if you want to any, ask, answer any questions please feel free to reach out to me email is quite easy john.banner.greatech.com just drop me an email i'll try and answer it as soon as possible i'm quite busy so i'll get to it as soon as i can but um, basically, just let me know if you want to talk about anything. There's just so much information out there. It's very difficult to encapsulate that all in 60 minutes. And with that, it brings me towards the end of today's presentation. So thank you very much for your attention and attending today.